One, two, three. We're here for the launch finally of the beginning of the Complete Street for improvements along the Cab Avenue. This project is very, very important. It falls into the category of promises made being promises kept. There's been a lot of charrettes and community engagement around improvements to this district. It's been fits and starts around implementation and scope. We finally have a scope. We finally have allocation of funding. They've selected the contractor. We are finally getting started. This is an important corridor that connects DeKalb County to Atlanta. It connects to Stone Mountain and some other bikes and trails. So this is a very, very important corridor. This is phase one. We're looking forward to having phase two happen in the near future, but we're excited to finally have a start to a very important project. Even though it's overcast, this is an incredibly exciting day. Um, the Cav Ave has been a dangerous street on the east side of Atlanta for a long, long time. Uh, and I am super excited that we're breaking ground on phase one today, um, making this safer for the neighborhoods to touch it on both sides, for folks who ride MARTA or who cycle down on their way to or from downtown. Um, but I want to underscore that this is just phase one, um, that there is unfinished work that we have here. and. It'll be important to pass a new TSPOS and a new infrastructure bond next spring um, so we can do the full project um, and give our residents what they deserve. It's all part of the larger, you know, honestly, the Vision Zero um, of making sure that no Atlanta resident is injured or dies um, on our streets. And today's groundbreaking is a step in making sure that that doesn't happen again on DeKalb Ave. And this is an exciting day to be able to come out here for this groundbreaking where we are uh, breaking ground on the uh, DeKalb Avenue uh, safety improvements. This project has been in the making for quite a while and I'm glad that the community gave their input in the beginning for us to even come to this place to get this uh, project started and then throughout the process they have always advocated and been very patient but now today we're ready to get started on this project and how exciting it's going to be to have people uh, that, mot that motorists that are on this road, cyclists, wheelchairs, pedestrians will be much safer on a better road that services everyone. This project specifically is about safety. A number of the projects are about uh, creating uh, beautification, making sure the roads are smooth, all that's important, but uh, specifically this project is because we had this reversible lane that has been there for so long that individuals have sometimes had head-on collisions because they didn't know if it was supposed to be going uh, east or west at this time of day. And so it's caused crashes that we can avoid by now having this to be a proper shared lane. And so then we also are going to have protected bicycle lanes that uh, wheelchairs, bicycles, uh, scooters and others can utilize to stay out of the road. So this is about safety, getting people where they're going each day and where they're going in life in a safe way is going to be critical, whether they're riding MARTA or whether they're just taking a trip. We're here because uh, to celebrate the groundbreaking for the first dog park in District 4, and not only in District 4, but in Southwest Atlanta, and it's right here in the Mosley Park community. So we're very excited to be here today. 
it's important to have a dog park for really for the for the health of the dog uh, as well as the health of the community. There are a lot of people that they live in inner city so there may not be enough land you know let's say for a large dog they may not have enough land for a large dog just to run around uh, the backyard or the front yard and so when you have that dog park then they can bring the dog to the park and, and just let them have fun with other dogs. I just really want to thank the Friends of Mosley Park for all of their work over the last four or five years with their visioning plan and helping us move forward. And uh, Park Pride has just been tremendous in regard to raising monies that, that have been needed. And uh, the Parks Department under the guidance of Doug Vaz has just been tremendous with getting the job done and and Park Design has done done a great job with taking the visioning plan and putting it in reality on paper and then bringing it out here and putting it uh, 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 making the projects work right here on the ground in this 33 acre space. been here through the hard times, the good times, and has stayed so much an important part of what makes Kirkwood wonderful. And so this is the highest honor that the city of Atlanta can confer upon any citizen. It is a proclamation. And it is in honor of your life and your legacy. We're here today to commemorate the 100th birthday of a Kirkwood neighbor, Miss Thelma Favors. For his work as an accomplished performer, jazz film documentarian, composer, conductor, and historian, and his commitment to jazz education. Dr. James Hardy Patterson is an institution. He loves Atlanta and he's given so much to Atlanta and helped us here in Atlanta to uplift and make jazz a part of our lives here in the city of Atlanta. And it was an honor and a privilege to give the proclamation to him today. It was signed by myself and all 15 members of council. And we certainly want to recognize people. We want to give them their flowers while they do. And his are overdue. We should have been uh, proclaiming him a long time ago. But now at this festival, at this time, I think is even more appropriate that he can be with other musicians and, and be around the spirit and the, and the movement of jazz around him and in the air. And I think he really appreciated it. We certainly miss coming together. We certainly miss our jazz festival, something that we look forward to every year, uh, sort of a rite of passage for summer. But you know, the fall, uh, this going into the fall, is not bad, it's not as hot, uh, but people are coming out and able to social distance and enjoy good jazz music and fellowship with family and friends uh, and hear the great sounds of jazz. Jazz history means a lot to Atlanta. There are many things that the city builds on and you think about what brings people to Atlanta and jazz and particularly uh, all of the jazz festivals that we have. They bring visitors in from other places and when people come some of them want to stay because of the music. I know music brought me to Atlanta. Uh, and then some people, you know, they come and they want to continue to visit. And of course that helps our revenue, it helps our city, and it certainly helps Atlanta's brand.
Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member George Shepard. I'm the chair of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. And we will officially call our meeting to order today. Ms. Lindo, are you there? Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. Would you go ahead and do a roll call, please? Yes. We have Council Member Dustin Hillis. Here. Council Member Andrea L. Boone. Present. Council Member Carla Smith. Here. Council Member Michael Julian Bond. Council Member Cleta Winslow. Present. Council Member Amir Faroki. Council Member uh, Shepard, um, uh, Madam Chair, we do have a quorum of members present. All right, thank you, Ms. Lindo. Would you now go ahead and read the remote meeting statement? Yes, good afternoon. Today's Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee meeting will be conducted remotely as advertised and in accordance with the Georgia Code Section 50-14-1. The meeting will be conducted in conformance with Robert Rules of Order and the Rules of Council as authorized by the City Code. The public may access the meeting conference bridge toll-free by dialing 877-579-6743 and entering conference ID number 831-591256. This information was also provided on the Friday, September 24th public meeting notice. The public may also view the meeting on Channel 26, the council's homepage at citycouncil.atlanta.ga.gov, Facebook and Twitter pages at ATL Council, and the council's YouTube channel. All presentations are available on the Atlanta City Council website and accessible via the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee presentations page. Today's meeting agenda was also published and made available on Friday, September 24th via the city's website at atlantacityga.iqm2.com. In addition, the public was able to submit comments via voicemail at 404-330-6022 yesterday between the hours of 4 and 7 p.m. These comments will be played during the public comment portion of this meeting. All persons present on the remote council meeting conference bridge are requested to please mute your phones and speakers. Meeting participants wishing to speak must be acknowledged by the committee chair. All amendments, substitute presentations, and informational documents have been distributed to committee members beforehand. Thank you all in advance for your cooperation. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We will now move for the adoption of the agenda, but let me just say we're gonna make some changes, a few changes to the agenda. First, there's gonna be a walk-in paper that will be coming forth. It will be actually a partner with another piece of legislation that we have held that will come off of hell. So we're gonna be asking for a walk-in paper to come forth. We also will actually from the presentation, have one additional presentation, and that is up on the Atlanta, uh, the city of Atlanta, Parks Department and APD uh, talking about the Parks Security Plan update. So those are the two updates to the agenda. Can I get a motion to, or I'll make a motion to uh, amend the agenda and get make a motion to approve? Is there a second? Winslow second. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. All right. Is there anyone who needs to vote via uh, voice today? Well, I do, Council Member. Oh, this I'm sorry. Well, Winslow, yes. Yeah. I got you. Okay. I got you. Okay. okay. Bond, thank you. Mr. Bond, are you there? Ms. Boone, are you, we're waiting on two more votes from Ms. Boone and Mr. Hiller. Yes, Madam Chair, I'm trying to get on, I'm online, but it's not recording, so it's my experience, yes. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Hiller. You. I'm trying to Thank record you. my vote, it's spinning, but yes. Thank you. The vote is closed, Madam Chair. That's five yeas, zero nays. That the, the agenda has been amend that amend has been amended. Okay, now I'll make a motion to 
uh, accept the uh, agenda as amended. There are seconds. Second, Winslow. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindell. The vote is open, Madam Chair. All right. The vote is closed. As five years zero names, the agenda has been adopted as amended. Thank you, Ms. Linda. <laughs> we now move to approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve? I'll, I'll make the motion to approve. Is there a second? Ms. Winslow, do you would like to second the minutes? Yes, second. Thank you. We're ready for the vote. Ms. Lindo. The vote is open, Madam Chair. The vote is closed. That's five days zero eight. The meeting minutes have been approved. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We're now at public comments. I believe we have five minutes and 16 seconds of public comments. Ms. Lindo, are you, we ready? Yes, one moment, Madam Chair. This is Steve Kerr. I'm calling from 678-886-8666. This is regarding my September 8th of comments regarding the proposed public safety training facility. I have attended the Atlanta Citizens Police Academy about 20 years ago. I did it and have recommended it to many others. I was personally assured in July of 2021 by Atlanta Police Foundation CEO Jay Wilkinson that I could get a draft site plan and an area map. Today I've received neither. In my September 8, 2021 public comments to the Atlanta City Council, I asked for both the draft site plan and the area map, and three other items. The draft environmental phase one report, a list of other potential sites, and a copy of an engineering building inspection report of the current facilities. As of this call, I have received nothing. Even though I did not say, quote, this is a Georgia Open Records request, please understand that it was and it is. These are substantive requests. Request that each council person, each of you, should have publicly asked and assured the public that a fair and honest and willing would take place. I own property next to Entrenchment Creek, the same polluted Entrenchment Creek that flows next to the proposed site of this training facility. My property and some of my neighbor's property have been victimized by combined sewer overflows. I have repeatedly called the Department of Watershed Management and the Office of the Council Utilities Committee Chair, Natalie Archibald, with no results. Your city, our city, has polluted my property through upstream overdevelopment. There should be a building moratorium until our critical infrastructure problems are mitigated. Again, this is Steve Carr. I'm at 678-886-8666. Please return my calls. Greetings, council members and staff, and special greetings to you citizens and voters of Atlanta, monitoring your government in action between now and November 2nd. Ben Howard, senior advocate, public policy analyst. Fewer than 50. Three council districts, 11, 12, and post three at large, yet fewer than 50 residents non-residents, presenters, visitors, and representatives of city departments and city officials are present at any given neighborhood planning unit or meeting. Crime running rampant, and no NPUR Public Safety Committee since Loretta Green left. It was in 50. The neighborhoods of Adams Park, Fort Valley, Greenbrier, Lawrence Valley, Pomona Park and Southwest are part of NDUR, yet fewer 
thousand and fifty. Diverse churches, including Mount Carmel, the Love Temple, Greater New Life, St. Mark, and St. Peter, a part of neighborhood planning unit are yet fewer than fifty. American Legion Post nine one one and Campbellton Road Business and Merchant Association, yet fewer than fifty. Tyler Perry, Fort McPherson, and a theme park on the way, yet fewer than fifty. Advocates like Edith Latipo, Ben Howard, and Ron Secure, standing ready to rally the community to combat homelessness, income inequality, high water bills, and environmental injustice. Will they ever be invited to the table? Not by the NPUR 9. Fewer than 50 forever? It seems that way. Because firmly united against all who dare seek a better way, a brighter day, and greater inclusiveness, are Antonina Robinson, Collins Clare, Ricardo Jacobs, Bernette L. Scott, August White, Allison Hathaway, Cheryl Brown, Jerry Williams, Agent X, and those undercover NPUR9 allies, enablers, and supporters. That concludes the public comments, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Lindo, if you can go back, I, I heard some of what Mr. Carr was saying. I, I don't know if we can provide him with what we initially have now as a plan for the, the renderings and the plans for the uh, academy, the Public Safety Academy, and any other things. But could you possibly reach out to him and see if we can provide him with any of the information he's talking about? Yes, yeah, so we'll do. All right. Thank you. All right. We're now up under communications. Uh, we're up under number one. Ms. Lindo, would you sound that, please? Yes, Madam Chair. That's 21C, 0123, This is communications from um, Patrick Labat, Fulton County Sheriff, appointing Ms. Amanda Pritchett to serve as a member of the Public Safety Commission. Thank you. And is Ms. Pritchett here today? Good afternoon, Chair. I am here on the phone. Thank you, Ms. Bridget, for coming. Uh, we appreciate your volunteerism and uh, representing uh, uh, Sheriff Labatt. Uh, can you just give us a little information about yourself, please? Sure. Thank you, guys, um, all of you, for inviting me on today. Just a little bit about myself. Um, many of you may recognize my name from working with Sheriff Labatt when he was the Chief of Corrections. In the city of Atlanta, I was his deputy chief there for a time. And then I was um, moved over to Atlanta Police Department where I served as the non director for a short period of time as well. So I've served the city of Atlanta and I am looking forward to continuing to do so in this partnership now that I'm with Fulton County. Thank you, Ms. Pridget. Uh Is there any questions from my colleagues? Why to entertain a uh, motion? Move mm -hmm. approval. Let well, I'll let Council Member Bond go ahead. Uh, move approval. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Bond. Thank you. Uh, so that's a motion and a second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Linda. The vote is up, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Everyone, please vote. The vote is closed. That's 68. There are nays. That item is favorable. Thank you. And we've been joined by Council Member Bond. Thank you, Mr. Bond, for joining. And Ms. Pritchett, thank you so much well, for serving. We appreciate you. I've been on the call. I was present for the votes. I'd like to be recorded. Oh, okay, I asked, and I, I didn't hear you, Mr. Bond. I don't know if he was muted or whatever. Yeah, I was still muted. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Lindo, do we have to go back on that? Ms. Christian, I want to thank you for serving us uh, for volunteering, sir. Let me just finish that. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Madam Chair, we can add um, 
uh, Council Member Bond to the agenda and um, the re the um, minutes approval. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. We have one other piece of communication that's on hell, item number 17, that will come off, and that's appointing Mr. Robertson to the Public Safety Commission. Ms. Lindo, is Mr. Robertson here today? I'm verifying that with staff, Madam Chair. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Robertson, for coming. Uh, some of us know you, but many may not. I thank you for volunteering to serve on this commission. Would you just tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yes, Madam Chair. I uh, I run the Central Atlanta Progress in the Atlanta Downtown Improvement District. Been involved with many uh, public safety initiatives over the last 40 years and uh, look forward to serving and helping as best we can. Thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues for Mr. Robinson? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Second, Winslow. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. We're ready for the vote. Ms. Lindo. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I don't believe that I um, founded that legislation. Oh, did you not? Oh, wow. No. <laughs> we went through the whole process. Why don't we sign the legislation, Ms. Lake? <laughs> okay. Let's do that. <laughs> Just, yeah. That, yes, that's 21C0108. This is a communication from Donna Hall, Chair of the Central Atlanta Progress, Board of Directors, submitting the appointment of Mr. A.J. Robinson to serve as a member of the Public Safety Commission. All right. And we've heard the legislation. I think we've already voted on it. Mr. Yes, Robinson is serving in the same capacity as Ms. Pritchett under a different entity. But again, I think the motion was passed six, six yeas and zero nays. Mr. Robinson, thank you so much for serving us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Next, we're now up under presentations, Ms. Lindo. Uh, we have the first one with the Atlanta Police Department. And that's going to be our assistant chief, Tori Cott. Are you there, Mr. Cott? Yes, good afternoon, Council Member, Councilwoman Shepard, and other other council members. Uh, I'd like to present to you all our bi weekly uh, presentation. Can you go to slide number two, please? It is going to uh, show the COBRA report for week 38. Um, this shows that violent crime is still a challenge. It's showing that uh, shooting incidents are down 8% for the 28-day period. We believe we're making some movement in this because of uh, some reorganization that we've done, and I've talked about it the last couple of uh, presentations. Our investigations are connecting, connecting the dots faster. Uh, I, some examples of those investigative units would be our robbery unit, the aggravated assault unit, and our domestic violence unit. Uh, the domestic violence unit is something that was recently created. We feel that that is definitely making uh, some strides in lowering the violence in the city. Domestic violence is down 28% for the 28-day period. This is a 87% change from August, which is uh, huge. This is a testament to the work that the domestic violence unit is doing. Uh, they're doing this with with the assistance of the victim witness unit um, that Ms. Muhammad uh, leads, our property crime is, w is what actually is driving the numbers. Everyone is talking about violent crime as, as well as they should, but property crimes is what's um, driving the numbers. You'll see that property crime makes up about 83% of the, the total crime. And an example, a huge example of that would be the auto thefts and also the auto larcenies. Can we go to the next slide? I'm gonna talk about that shortly also, but can we go to the next slide? The next slide is gonna um, show the auto crimes enforcement detail, or as we call them, our ACE unit. Our ACE unit recently did a, a, um, a detail with the Georgia State Patrol 
also uh, South Fulton Police Department. The violent crime uh, nexus, violent crime is a nexus to property crime, and this detail showed it. One moment. Whoever is not talking other than the chief right now should be muted. Please mute your phone. Go ahead, kid. All right. Violent crime is a nexus to property crime, and this unit uh, shows it because property crime is typically talked about as um, stolen autos and also auto larcenies. But when people steal um, the cars, they use the cars to commit violent acts, and they also use the stolen cars to break into other cars. Um, with us working consistently with our metro area partners, we're able to arrest these individuals and bring down crime not only for Atlanta but for the metro area and these pictures and the, the stats up there show just some of the things that they did on this recent detail can you go to the next slide slide number four please slide number four is going to talk about our uh, domestic violence unit I talked about that a couple of slides ago but our domestic violence unit is making some huge strides as we all know, domestic violence not only affects that individual, but it also affects the community, it affects the families, the children, and with the domestic violence unit being able to close out cases and make arrests, it is something that's having a positive effect on the community. We feel that the domestic violence unit is making a difference because they're able to talk to the victims faster. Um, and that's we talked to victims previously, but just by having a domestic violence unit that focuses not only on domestic violence, it helps us talk to those victims basically as soon as the the incident happens. Um, and this is helping us go to court faster. It, it helps us be able to obtain warrants faster. So it, it's making a difference. We feel that some of the changes or some of the positive effects uh, that are coming out from this is when the city opened up from COVID, uh, it gave people an outlet. They weren't stuck in the house or stuck in an apartment with each other. They were able to go out. So not only does our domestic violence unit help lower that, but the city opening up is also, so also helping it. And these stats up here is just showing some of the things um that that happened as you notice on the stat it shows that the domestic violence unit went into effect on june 24th since june 24th they have been able to make 70 arrests and have uh, 182 warrants issued and that again that is huge and we go to the next slide please the next slide is slide number five and it's going to talk it's going to show the repeat offender unit uh, by definition, the repeat offender unit um, is a career criminal that has three or more felony convictions. And when they have three or more felony convictions, it raises the eyebrows of, of, of everyone. The offender is added and the Fulton County is added and we also send it over to the district attorney's office, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. And when it um, comes into play for the Cab County District's Attorney's Office, we also send it over there. As of August, we have identified 480 offenders. And this affects both sides of the equation. It affects the property crimes and also the crimes against person. As I mentioned, we work with both District Attorney's Office on a daily basis. And this helps us uh, tell a better story when we go before the judge, we not only have that um, that crime or for that specific incident, but we're able to also paint the picture of what that individual has done in the past. And we feel that gives us a stronger case when we go before the judge and it will help us keep the people off of the street that needs to be kept off of the street. Can you go to the next slide, please? Slide number six. It's going to be recovered firearms. I know some of you all may be tired about of me and Chief Ryan talking about 
firearms or recovered firearms or stolen firearms, but it's, this is still a problem. It's still a huge issue. So I wanted to show a chart on this again. This is showing that the stolen firearms or recovered firearms are throughout the entire city. It's not just one part of the city, so we can't just say it's the north end or the southwest end. This is the entire city, and this affects the entire city and also the metro area. Um, this stat shows that we have recovered over 2,000 firearms. Over 2,000 firearms is quite a bit. So I'm asking, I'm pleading that the citizens and people that come into the city secure the firearms when they uh, leave their vehicles and go inside the houses or the stores. Please secure your firearms. Can we go to the next slide, please? This last slide is going to show auto thefts and auto larcenies. These crimes account for 53% of all Part 1 crimes. I know in the first slide I talked about um, property crime is 83%. Out of that 83%, auto, auto theft and auto larcenies account for 53% of this. Vehicles with keys in them and vehicles left unsecured are driving these two categories. We have units um, dedicated, investigative units dedicated to investigating these crimes. So we put a lot of effort and a lot of time into that. Again, I'm asking uh, individuals, citizens, and visitors to secure your vehicles. Help us and don't leave your cars running. That's it for my presentation and I'm available to answer any questions that you all may have. Questions for my colleagues? Madam Chair? Yes, sir, Mr. Bond. Oh, I have a couple of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Chief, for your presentation. And it is exciting news about the domestic violence unit. Uh, as you may be aware, that we had a Post one office had a, a virtual town hall meeting back in March on domestic violence when the statistics at that time from the previous year, I think it was domestic violence was up 50%. And uh, Ms. Muhammad was on that call. And so I just want to applaud you all for your efforts and making tremendous headway on that sphere of enforcement. I think that uh, you all need to continue the good work and uh, deserve a lot of acclaim for that. So I want to point that out. Uh, but my question is about securing firearms and vehicles. Do we currently have city ordinances that require that city residences, when, trans when transporting their firearms in their vehicles, uh, that they be uh, secured in, in a particular manner? Uh, Councilman Bonds, no, we do not have any city ordinances um, that require individuals to secure their firearms in their vehicles when they leave the vehicle. Well, I mean, would that be helpful to the police in inspiring people to uh, secure their weapons? Because it seems that even with the clean car campaign uh, that's been going on for years, you know, whether it's a firearm or a laptop or a pocketbook or whatever, it's, the message doesn't really seem to be getting, doesn't seem to be per permeating uh, to the community. Uh, Councilman Verbond, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I think that, uh, no, uh, our messaging has not, uh, sunk in with, with most people. Um, but as far as creating or passing some city ordinances, I think we need to be careful and think about the, the state laws. I think it would be stronger and serve us better, serve the entire state better if we had some state laws that were passed to require individuals to secure their, their firearms when, when they left their vehicles. Okay, I'll, I will get with uh, partners at the state to start having conversations like that. 
And lastly, uh, I'd like for you to confirm something uh, that I've heard, and I don't like to deal in rumors, so I'm going to just ask you to clarify. I've heard that the uh, that APD is no longer pursuing or enforcing warrants from the municipal court that are issued from the bench. Is is that true or accurate, or what? What's the situation around pursuing the warrants from the municipal court? No, sir. That that is not true. I have not heard anything, and uh, Chief Bryant nor myself we have not given out any orders or directions to not pursue any, any warrants from the municipal court. Okay, thank you for clarifying. That I withdraw, Madam Chair, and thank you, Deputy Chief. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Bond. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mr. Bond, the municipal court is going to be presenting today, so you may can ask that question again if you have any other questions in reference to that. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, Chief. Uh, court. Uh, up under domestic violence, um, is there a unit that specifically deals with the domestic violence in the LGBT community, or is there a need for that? Well, if if there is an outcry or something specifically has happened to an individual that they feel is, um, they feel happened specifically because they are in the LGBTQ community, that is looked up that is not only looked at by our domestic violence unit or whatever unit it may fall under whether it's a robbery or aggravated assault but we also have our homeland security unit that also looks into it to specifically see if that incident was ha was uh, focused on that individual because they are in the LGBT community so we look at it on from several different aspects Okay, so uh, do you see a lot of crime, a high crime in the LGBTQ with domestic violence? I mean, is that something that's really high? Or is it, when I looked at the domestic violence, so I saw most of it in a certain part of the neighborhood and didn't seem to be in a concentrated area. So is there a high crime in the interest of domestic violence? Is it really high in the LGBTQ community? I'm just curious. Uh, Council Member Shepard, no. Uh the city of Atlanta, we do not, or we we do not, and we have not seen a high propensity of um, crimes directed towards the LGBTQ community. We believe that's because um, Atlanta is Atlanta, and we have such a good um, relationship with them. Uh, we're able to do some community service, some PSAs, where we're able to educate the, the community. And I, I want to say that a lot of it is because the people of Atlanta don't stand for it. So when something happens, they step in and step up. And if that doesn't work, then they call the police. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question. Repeat offenders unit. Um, I think you all just kind of pulled that in in the last several Month. Is that correct? This repeat offender unit uh, that you're working in conjunction with the uh, uh, Fulton County uh, DA's office and other folks, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. It's a unit that we had um, a couple of years ago. Chief Wyatt saw the need to bring it back. So we did um, reinstitute the repeat offenders unit. And with that, we uh, worked closely with the DeKalb County District Attorney and also the Fulton County District Attorney. Okay. So how many folks do we have in that unit? Is there, uh, and could you give me a little bit more detail? I mean, it sounds great. I've heard some conversation about it, but I know one of the issues we've been having in municipal court that I understand in all of these courts, not municipal courts, I'm sorry, Fulton County Court, is that uh, we have so many offenders who are we just right now continuously uh, and I, some of it's based on data and not collaborating. So, again, what you're doing is working this in conjunction with other municipalities and the DA's office to make sure that we don't allow repeat offenders out on a regular basis and that they should be in jail to stay in jail until they can go to court or whatever happens to them. Is that correct? Just tell us a little bit more detail about it. Well, presently, I believe, I know we have a sergeant and I believe six 
officers, six officers, investigators assigned to that unit. Um, that unit works in conjunction with our other investigative units. So they don't do any cases by themselves, essentially. If it is a robbery case or aggravated assault case, those robbery and aggravated assault investigators work that case. But any arrest and any incident where we have someone identified, the repeat offender unit also looks into that um, into that individual and they run the background to see if that person is a repeat offender. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I think I said six. We have three investigators and a sergeant that work that unit. Okay. And that really helped. I know I was with uh, uh, Ms. Willis uh, at an event, and she was talking about it and how, of course, we all know that she's already did this call out with Pocahontas County because they're really so far behind. But one of the issues specifically was around repeat offenders. And so it's great that we have a unit now that's true up that can begin to address that because, when, like you said earlier, some of these offenders are the same ones that are coming back out and doing other things in the community. So if we can make sure our documentation and that we have a unit that's looking at all of that more comprehensively, that helps us a lot. So I'm excited about that. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Th thank you. Uh, one other question is, uh, our law department wants to speak, Ms. Robinson would like to speak in terms of the question that Mr. Bond asked in reference to uh, firearms and cars. Ms. Robinson, are you there? Yes, um, good afternoon. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, there was, um, to, uh, Council Member Bond did bring up um, the possibility of passing an ordinance which would govern um, the securing of weapons and of vehicles. And I did want to inform the, the committee that um, unfortunately state law does um, explicitly preempt the city from taking any action, pursue, uh, be it through ordinance or otherwise to um, regulate or otherwise direct the possession ownership, transport, carrying, transfer, sale, purchase, licensing, or registration of firearms or other weapons or components of firearms. And that is pursuant to OCGA 1611-173, um, subsection B1. Um, so we wouldn't be able to do that. Madam Attorney. Hello. Go ahead, Mr. Burr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. But that doesn't preclude us from putting an option in our legislative package, correct? Request it most certainly does not. Mm -hmm. Okay. We most thank certainly you. could do that. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Bond. And thank you, Assistant Chief Court, uh, for your report. We now have another part of the uh, report that you've asked for, too. And that's uh, a report from 911, 911 director. And I believe Ms. Arnold is here to do that presentation. Ms. Arnold, are you available? Ms. Lindo, is Ms. Arnold on the call? Yes, I am here. Are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go okay. ahead. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so our staffing here at 911 continues to be a concern. Um, as you can see on the slide presented, our current staffing is 154 employees. Uh, staffing analysis completed earlier this year identified a need for 18 additional employees. And this request for additional positions was approved and it is reflected in the 25 vacancies that we currently have. Additionally, we hired 35 new employees. 15 employees resigned this year and there are currently 11 in some form of the hiring process. Within the past year, we have also rehired five former employees that left to pursue other careers and returned. Our recruitment efforts are continuous um, as we at the positions recurring on atlantaga.gov, we are represented at job fairs. We have posted the position on 27 
job boards, and it's also advertised via public affairs on social media. Of the 35 new leads... Madam Chair, I apologize. We're not... Um, we're not... We don't have a report... Uh, Madam Chair, I apologize. We're all set, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. We want to make sure that the public could follow along. Okay. Thank you. We don't need to go back. We'll just keep going, correct? That's correct. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Arnold. Continue. All right. Of the 35 newly hired employees, 12 of those employees have been released to answer 911 calls on their own. You can go to the next slide, please. of those uh, employees were released to answer 911 calls, so they're currently on our floor uh, working. 21 are in a hybrid training program uh, that consists of six weeks of in-class training and 10 weeks of on-the-job training. At the end of the training process, these employees will be able to take 911 calls and dispatch on police calls. Our previous training program only allowed them once they finished completing class to take 911 calls. So we have hybrid class one that consists of six employees. That class began in June. They're expected to be released from training between October 8th and October 15th. The dates are contingent upon release date for each employee. Hybrid class two consists of six employees as well. They are expected to be released from training in mid-November. Hybrid class three consists of seven attendees. Uh, those those employees are still in some form of classroom training. They will be released this week, and they will begin their on-the-job training. And hybrid class four consists of our two newest hired employees, and they're currently in classroom training as well. So of the 35 new hires, two resigned. Those two employees felt that the job was more than they expected. And again, and it did not provide them enough balance between work and personal life. Uh, as a result of that, we have began to allow potential new hires to visit the center and listen in on call taking and dispatching prior to being officially hired. It's our hope that providing this insight into the profession assists the potential candidate with making the determination about their their ability to do the job prior to being officially hired. And as we continue to staff our shift, we are reviewing the possibility of rotating schedules, which may also assist with challenging schedules that our newer employees complain about. Uh, that's where we are right now with our staffing and hiring. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. That's it. Right. I have a couple of questions. Is that the end of the presentation? Okay, yes, go ahead. So, Ms. Arnold, I'm still getting out in my community, I think my colleagues are getting 
calls in reference to 911 and people being put on hold for a long period of time. And we knew, you know, that you all in the process of truing up in terms of hiring. But when we do an assessment of the status of where you are right now, would you say, I mean, we've, we've done everything we can to support you all in terms of even a pay increase, uh, looking at hiring more people. Uh, can you give me any insight on where we are in terms of folks on calls on hold and the status of that? Yes, I can. So our center receives, right now we're receiving an average of 3,100 calls per day. One of the steps that we're taking toward controlling that call volume and people being placed on hold, the biggest issue is technology. So we're currently working to upgrade our phone system. This is going to be very um, crucial to us being able to manage the call volume. Our phone system right now does not allow us to separate emergency from non-emergency calls, nor does it allow the call taker to determine that this is an, a non-emergency call. I need to place it on hold so that I can then answer the next calls that are waiting in queue. So this upgrade to our phone system is due December or January, we're hoping. Right now it's in the attorney at the legal level. Uh, the other thing that we have is we have ASAP to PSAP, and just in a nutshell, that basically allows security companies to enter alarm calls into our CAT system, to our computer system. And just to give you a little background on that, that will reduce our call volume by more than 50,000 calls per year. Uh, alarm companies, and most of these alarm calls are false alarms. However, they have to call 911 in order to receive a response. Last year, we received over 50,000 of those calls. Additionally, they call back to cancel alarms and also check the status of the alarms. And they also have to call 911 each time that they enter an alarm into a person's uh, residence, just residence or business, to ensure that this is the correct agency. So those are some of the steps that we're taking, and most of it is going to be uh, technological as well as public education and ensuring that citizens are aware of when to call 911 versus 311, uh, not to hang up when they call, uh, not to call from multiple lines, several citizens not calling about the same issue at the same time because it floods our system. Uh, recently, we conducted, we looked at the the call volume and at some points of the day we're receiving well over 200 calls per hour. So hopefully these technology advances will definitely assist us as it will allow us to separate the emergency from the non-emergency calls and we'll be able to triage a call, determine that it's an emergency or not an emergency and park it and handle the next call. So that ASAP to PSAP, is that a part of that technology that you're talking about also? Or how, how, how will you fix that? The ASAP to PSAP is a new techn technological advancement. The ASAP to PSAP is what will allow the alarm companies to enter alarm calls into our computer system from there. They never have to dial 911. Okay, I'm sorry. Then have we implemented that already or we tr is that a part of the new technology that we're trying to implement? Right. This technology, they're finalizing the, they're, they're in the process this week of actually making sure that everything works properly. And once that's been taken care of, then we expect to implement it within the next two to three weeks. So it's been okay. through. Um, okay. And then the other work, the other issues you're having, you're saying are due to some legal issues or something within our administrative portion that will actually upgrade our technology and you're saying you estimate it's going to be December, January before then. What are, what are the, you know what the technological, I mean, what the issues are internally as to why we can't go ahead and finish it up. Do you have any ideas? This is, this is con contractual between the attorney. Uh, the, a, the upgraded system, they sent the red line copy today. It's being reviewed by the attorney's office, by the city attorney's office. So we're just waiting for uh, that process to work its way through. 
Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for my colleagues? From Ms. Grant? Madam Chair. Arnold, the other. I said Grant McConnell. I'm sorry, who's speaking? Hello. Hello, Mr. Bond, Ma is that you? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Director. Just a couple of questions. In dealing with the uh, commercial and alarm calls, has it ever been considered to have a alternative number or concierge service just uh, for those commercial, what I guess would be considered commercial industry calls as opposed to general 911 calls? Not to my knowledge. However, due to the same technology that we have for 911 calls, even those citizens and uh, the alarm companies do use the 404-658-6666 number, which is a non-emergency line. We have a dedicated number, but we don't have a dedicated line. So all calls are going in through the same 911 phone queue. Is it possible to, I guess, dedicate a couple of people on the ship just for those numbers or do they not come in that frequently overall no the majority of our calls are non-emergency so just to go back to the upgraded phone system currently it doesn't matter which number you call if you call 911 or you call the non-emergency phone line they're all going into the same queue even though you dial two separate numbers with the upgrade. Well, oh, oh, well, I guess that's what I was asking, is if instead it's, of them all going into the same queue, couldn't a certain section of those numbers go into a separate queue so that they're not that's, clogging up the uh, system? That's exactly what the upgrade is for. Oh, okay. I, I understand. And, well, I guess my second question is, I, know, I might have mentioned this. I don't. I don't think I mentioned this to, to you, Madam Director. Have you all considered recapturing some employees that may have retired or uh, might, might be able to help out on a temporary basis? That may have gone to other jobs, but still may have uh, some available time to come in, bolster your shifts, similar to what APD does with the instant recapture program. Yes, we currently have five, at least five recaptures um, in our staff. Oh, okay. We also have uh, three part-time workers, and these are employees that worked for us previously. They work a full-time job somewhere else, and they come back and work part-time for us as well. Okay, so you all are gathering back somehow. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, and uh, I will draw a message. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for your report. All right. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. Next, we will have uh, the Atlanta Police Department and the Department of Fire Park Security Plan update. Who's presenting? I don't have a name. Hi. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. This is John Dargle. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you, Commissioner Dargle? I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, again, John Dargle, your commissioner for the Department of Parks and Recreation. And joining me today is uh, Atlanta Police Department's uh, Captain Lucas Wagerman as well. The purpose of our presentation is to provide you an update on the work between the Atlanta Police Department and the Department of Parks and Recreation to date and the three-phase approach to address council's legislation related to the safety and security plan of our parks and recreation facilities. Next, next slide, please. On June 7, uh, 2021, if you can go to the next slide. Ordinance 21-0322 was introduced to city council by council member Michael Julian Bond, authorizing the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Atlanta Police Department to complete a joint study 
for the purpose of determining funding for the total number of retired police officers that would be required through the recapture program to cover the parks and parks facilities. And on August 16, 2021, Resolution 21-R-3727 was introduced in city council by council member Joyce Shepard requesting that Atlanta Police Department evaluate the process to facilitate the installation of video surveillance cameras at city of Atlanta parks and recreation facilities to help deter criminal activity. Next slide. Ordinance uh, 21-0322 proposes we are retired APD officers at last held salary without benefits. It would aid in the creation of park patrol program, allocate sufficient funding to cover salaries, and the study should consider the number of eligible employees assigned to APD full time. Some of the considerations that we've faced is difficult to identify and retire Atlanta Police Department officers to participate in the program and identify funding, even though council authorized to be paid from the general fund to ski year 22. Next slide. And resolution 21-R-3727 proposes a process to evaluate with costs to install cameras in city parks and parks facilities. And the effort should be coordinated between APD, Atlanta Police Foundation, and Parks and Recreation. Some of the considerations that we had were the expenses of upgrading cameras and installing new ones. Funding must be identified, obviously. And also tree cover, lighting, and the number and type of cameras to ensure integration. Next slide. Atlanta Police Department's recapture program and retire program is not the catch-all for safety and security of our, of our parks and recreation facilities. Since the introduction of the legislation, we have been working with the administration and the Atlanta Police Department looking at building a comprehensive general security plan addressing parks and recreation areas, buildings, and facilities to include police patrolling, use of security forces, the fake camera systems, lighting, and landscaping. Currently, if you can go to the next slide, uh, currently we're, we're continuing to implement already identified security measures to include collecting three years of data and identified top 20 parks and recreation centers the number, we'll continue to determine the number and location of cameras for the top 20 parks and recreation facilities, continue implementing safety and security measures at pools and other sites, continue uh, installing cameras at new parks such as Cook Park, Westside Park, and the Bell Line, continue fitting and upgrading cameras at our rec centers, and improve the relationship and coordination between the police department, the Atlanta Police Foundation, for Vic enabled cameras in high priority park areas and recreation facilities. And begin an in-service training between APD and DPR staff to ensure that we're fully prepared to respond to law enforcement incidents, defining our role in public safety and law enforcement such as see something to say something. We'll continue to review the Atlanta Police Department crime data for parks and recreation centers, addressing key findings for future investments in cameras and staffing based on highest needs. Now I will pass the presentation off to Captain Wagaman to provide you um, the data and also our three-phase approach. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee members, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to present our findings. My name is Captain Lucas Wagaman with the Strategies and Special Project Division. I act as the Executive Officer for Deputy Chief Sherbaum. In reviewing the top 20 sites, 
our tactical crime analysis unit pulled data from 2018 to 2021 year to date. In reviewing the parks, we broke it down between violent crimes and property crimes. Our data shows that the top three crimes was the top three parks for violent crime was Woodruff Park, Rosa Bernie Park, Piedmont, and Grant Park, respectively. Using that data, we looked at setting up a patrol unit park team, which would be comprised of one lieutenant, two sergeants, and 14 officers. We then reviewed and looked into the equipment needs in order to have a park patrol unit. In the park patrol unit, the initial startup for the equipment would be roughly 392,000. The personnel cost per year at a maxed out salary for each rank would be 1.29 million. The initial first year startup would be 1.683. We looked at staffing models to include three different kinds. One, a recapture, which we had no individuals showing interest. The second one was a retired reserve, which means hiring extra job officers at a rate of 50 per hour. And the third one was a parks extra job, was a combination of current APD sworn personnel and retired reserves. We then further looked into the data regarding the park. Next slide, please. The Atlanta Police Department is actively patrolling these parks. We utilize zone resource officers, the beat officer, crime suppression units, and quality of life officers to include the mounted patrol unit, the path force unit, and specialized unit from the community services division. Looking at the chart now, it shows that throughout from 2018, roughly the average percentage of total part one crime being committed in our city parks is between 1.12 and 1.45. The data below shows our current arrests in those parks throughout the reporting period. Next slide, please. In reviewing the data, we show that the crime occurs pretty evenly distributed throughout the week with a slight uptick on Saturdays. And the hours where the crime increases is between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. And then once again, at midnight with a slight spike. The rec center time, next slide please. All rec centers, crime by day, the high day is Wednesday. And then also the hours of operation. Once again, we're looking at the 6 p.m. hour. Next slide please. The next one is our future implementation. We begin with phase one, which is through DPR and APD to review the requirements for all VIC enabled cameras. APD will assess best methods for increasing our officers and security in the parks and develop recommendations for additional security measures. Phase two, which will be conduct site reviews and security assessments based on the park themselves to determine the total number of cameras and the location of those cameras. And we'll be working with the administration to locate the funding source. And then phase three will begin the implementation of the parks and rec security plan. Next slide, please. If there are any questions or comments or concerns. Thank you. Um, questions from my colleagues. Mr. Bond, we can start with you if you have any questions. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you, Major, for your presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Dargle. And thank, thank you for the presentation. I guess the obvious question is when do you 
begin to proceed uh, with putting this in place. But before you answer, I just want to compliment you on being so thorough uh, in putting, putting this together. But when when do you need to, uh, when will you all be proceeding? Well, uh, our plan is to begin the implementation of the, of the security plan by January of next year, 2022. So, so you we'll I guess you would expect to come back to council before our last meeting in December for the funding, uh, through the funding board. Yes, um, and we'll work with the administration on the, in December to identify funding sources and then potentially coming back to uh, this committee and our city council uh, for um, uh, funding to implement. Excellent. And this Thirdly, I know that I was surprised by some of the parks that you mentioned that had the, I guess, the highest occurrences of crime. In some of these other areas, which I'm sure you're aware, uh, that particularly over at the uh, Nature Preserve where you have groups of seniors, majority female seniors, that are walking in. They've had a considerable amount of car break-ins in that particular area. For those situations uh, like that, what do you plan to do in the immediate space to kind of address that and put some of those residents at ease? I mean, it's not only at Cascade Nature Preserve, but you know they're walking in the morning uh, off the peak times that you illustrated in the report. Well, Council we'll Member Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much for that question, Council Member Bond. Uh, we are in communication with Deputy Chief Peak over our field operations division and Major Tyus and Captain Canton in Zone 4. Um, they are definitely aware of it, and the day watch officers that patrol in Zone 4 have done and will continue to do directed patrols in those areas. Uh, I want to also add that we, we've installed cameras not only in the to, serve, to survey the parking lot but also trail cameras that we've installed as well so incidents like that and Oakland Cemetery is another good example uh, will right. be responsive to, to things that come up um, as an immediate need and work with the administration APD and the Atlanta Police Foundation uh, to you know, rally together to, to, to respond to some of those immediate needs rather than wait on our approach to these top 20 uh, parks and the overarching uh, safety and security planning. Okay. Well, I won't belabor this, but I just want to give you all uh, uh, high praise for responding in this way. And I'm looking forward uh, to its implementation and just thank you for the, the work and research you've done to uh, address this issue. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Let me just add that uh, this, this report is very interesting uh, in terms of that. And you all, the data shows that in terms of the, the top part, so that chart there shows City Park's data, the top 20 sites. Are the ones where we have the most amount of crime is that pretty much that's pretty accurate madam chair and yes ma'am that is correct. from 2018 to 2021 so part one crime i mean if you look at the numbers like this i'll take my but they're part two it says it's 15 uh crime part one crime from 2018 to 2021 uh that's that's, yes, that's really interesting of so violent crime five and property crime ten. I mean, this is this is good data. I mean, I know what happens is when we um, when we look at crime, especially when something egregious happens, like in the Anderson Park or somewhere else. And of course, we we know we have Keep My Park on there, but you know, everyone is concerned. Like we talk about the nature preserve. Um, I think it's important that we do look at this. I'm glad we're looking at this and doing the analysis. And I would say one of the best things I think we should do, I'm just going back, like right now, as quick as we can, 
we're trying to find the some cameras as best as we can and then take this data and we can talk about where we can put um, police. I mean, when we talk about Piedmont Park, Piedmont Park is a conservancy, so this should help in terms of uh, what's happening in Piedmont Park. It's not just on the ownership of the city. With some of these parks, we can do collaborations with. But I know in my district, I'm, I'm going to be working with a lot of police foundation and try to find money, but we, we really have got to find money for cameras in particular in some of these parks. And I understand the challenge I've talked to y'all before, some of y'all about the challenge of even where they are in the parks and the fact that we have the trees and looking at how we're going to do that. But I really want us to continue to work on it. As Mr. Bond is saying also, this is important. You know, we already know the West Side Park that they actually actually put actually cameras as a part of the rollout of West Side Park, and that's a great thing. And probably Cook Park also. But I truly believe that we need to start doing this across our city. If we're not going to be able to have police officers in our communities, I mean, in the parks all the time, then what we need to do is most definitely make sure we have cameras in areas that we know are vulnerable. So. I appreciate this, and uh, I, like Mr. Vaughn, I just want to come back, and I'll stay on top of this to see what are our next steps in terms of funding and meeting with the mayor's administration. And, you know, my colleagues, we're going to have a look at that in terms of the budget for next year. I don't know if y'all gave an estimate in terms of, well, you did say something about the police department, the cost, but even if you took cameras and looked at in these other areas, what would be the cost for cameras? So we can yes, begin, to look, at, so we begin to look at all of that. Go ahead. Yes, Madam Chair. We looked at the cost per camera. The initial startup per camera is $8,000 per camera, and then a $300 per year cloud storage fee. But then the assessment will be based on the size of the park and where we would get the most bang for our buck with the camera. What areas will be able to capture the most data for us? So is your plan to continue to look at that? I mean, what's the next steps in terms of that process? Yes, ma'am. That would, yes, Madam Chair, that would be the next the next step is to assess each individual park to determine the total number of cameras per park. Okay. So how long is that going to take? That we are going to have to utilize our video integration center. Um, outside vendors that we must contact and schedule to come out and review locations. I do not have an accurate timetable on that, ma'am. Who's going to take responsibility for that and come back to the committee on it? Who would that be? Would that be, be Mr. Is. Are you long? Uh, well, based on the, the phased approach, we're looking at, you know, 150 days, so by the end of December, We'll have done a, an assessment of the top 20 parks and recreation facilities based on the top 20 crime data. Okay. So, Ms. Lindo, we need to have them come back. Here we are in, um, well, what are we in? September? So, we need to have them come back, uh, possibly right at, right before we go on our recent, I mean, out for the holidays in December. To see, because I, I really want to make sure we follow through with this. It's not just a report. The same thing with Mr. Bond. I, I don't know how we're going to resolve the issues with Mr. Bond in terms of hiring folks, especially when you don't have folks who want to work, but as he talked about, off duty officers or other things. But, uh, but most definitely the camera piece. So if we could get a report back, Ms. Lindo, within the 1st of December, I would appreciate that. Have you all come back and continue to work on this? Because I'm very serious, and I think, uh, and we need to let our colleagues. We need to send this report out to our colleagues, also Ms. Lindo of the council, so they know what this report is, so that they can address it. I may be able to work with some folks to get some funding uh, for one of the parks in my district. I know there's only one over here for me, and actually, I'm already looking at putting the camera over there, but. Uh, we need to um, just let our colleagues know about this so they're aware of it so they can begin to work on this also. All right. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions from my colleagues? All right. 
Thank you so much. We appreciate you, Commissioner Goggle and, and Major. Thank you for your report. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right, thanks. We're now going to move on to our last presentation, which is the Municipal Court of Atlanta. So who's presenting? Is that Judge Porter? Who will be presenting? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Shepard. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, Again, thank you, Chairman Shepard and members of Public Safety and Legal Administration. My name is Rashida Davis. I am the Court Administrator and Chief Clerk of Court for the Municipal Court of Atlanta. Very excited to present our quarterly presentation. If we could start at slide number two. Um, so you guys may be aware that the court has been open and operational to the public since October of last year. We captured those numbers for you in this graph to show the progression of attendees and visitors at the court. Uh, our first month opening, we had less than 500 individuals enter the building. Uh, we've had as high as 30,000 uh, individuals visit our building and take care of our cases. We're able to handle and process this number of individuals by maintaining safe distance. We have markers throughout the court and signage. Each individual is temperature screened before they enter the court. They are also required to wear a mask over their nose and mouth at all times. There are hand sanitizer stations at each floor and exit and entry point. Also, uh, our partners in DEEM fog our public and private areas each day. This fog machine kills uh, viruses like SARS and COVID-19, in addition to hand wiping uh, surfaces on a more frequent basis. And so in total, since we've been open, we've had about 120,000 visitors um, enter our facility. Slide number three. These are familiar numbers for us. They are our traffic cases. Uh, we have to maintain the number of cases that are filed in the court and also the total number of closed cases. This is uh, capturing the time from August 20. 20 to current, which will be last month, uh, we are about 80, 83% of cases being resolved um, month over month. And as you can see, there's an increase in numbers that are being issued and filed over our more warmer months, and that is typical and on par with our previous years. Slide four, please. In addition to our standard traffic cases, we capture our criminal matters. These are individuals who have um, either been arrested or um, have a, a charge that may require an, an arrest for that offense. Uh, these offenses tend to be a, a lower number. We are hovering about 60% of our case clearance rate for our criminal cases, and this is pretty standard. It is a lower uh, close rate than our traffic numbers. And as you can see, the numbers have increased um, since August and are leveling back out. Slide five. Slide five represents our failure to appear numbers from August 2018 to August 2021. So it gives you a good idea year over year what our numbers look like for the failure to appear rate. Of course, during the pandemic, no FTAs were issued. Uh, we are back in an upper trend for our failure to appear numbers last month, having a little bit less than 5,800 uh, FTAs for the month. Slide six. Slide six represents the number of FTA cases that were closed. These are individuals who have come back to the court to resolve their open and outstanding matters. Um, this is uh, the time period of August again, 2020 to August 21. And we've had about 12,000 cases resolved where people come in on their own to resolve their cases with our court. Slide seven. Uh, 
Uh, we're very excited about our launch of our virtual court platform. We now have a platform that's available to defendants to handle their case without uh, stepping one foot inside of our court. So from start to finish, defendants are able to register and to communicate with the solicitor through the platform, uh, negotiate a deal with the solicitor, and then it, it can go to the judge. If they want to have a hearing or motion or a trial, they're able to do that virtually as well. Um, so this is a, a new tool in our bag to help us resolve cases and um, bring in some good feedback about this platform. The second technology update that we have um, is our kiosk. We have two kiosks in the court where you can now uh, request a disposition, update your address, uh, request a reset, and you don't have to communicate with one person at the court. So it's completely a contact list and it's another tool in our bag to, to help us navigate these times. Um, that concludes my presentation, my slide, and I will open it up to questions. Questions. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Bond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Administrator, for your presentation. Uh, and just a couple of questions. I, I want to ask you the same thing I asked Dep uh, Deputy Chief Point. Is there an issue with uh, the bench warrants from the court being acted upon or uh, being enforced? Um, at this time, the warrants are being returned unexecuted, but I believe the chief judge is on the line and he can provide some greater detailed um, information concerning the warrant. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Council Member Bond. This is uh, Judge Portis, and uh, that is something that we have been seeking to uh, work through uh, an issue with APD over the past several weeks and months. Um, as of now, the warrants that we are putting out um, have, uh, for different reasons, not been executed uh, and returned to the court. Uh, but that's something that uh, I myself has taken up as an issue and uh, reached out to the police chief to see if there is uh, some work that can be done to uh, open that function and pipeline back up so we can uh, reactivate that uh, right now. Uh, that is across all classifications and categories of cases. So for obvious and good reason, we want to make sure that for those who don't uh, appear in court to answer that charge, that uh, they are accountable for uh, the choices and decisions as well as the charges against them. Oh, okay, thank you for that. But just a, a question to clarify for the public. So if, what is the result of it? I, well, this is an obvious question, but I'd I just like for you to uh, put, put it out there for the public. If an, if an FDA warrant is not enforced, uh, that means an individual, when we had the conversation earlier about repeat offenders, they could potentially offend and then get out and not be held or, or kept, or they, they could be allowed to sign themselves out again after offending. Is that correct? If, Uh, that yes, that is a, a part of it. Uh, the at least in the city of Atlanta, for instance, the uh, mechanism of the bond ordinance is, is a component where if an individual has a failure to appear warrant, uh, they're not eligible at the door for a signature bond. So uh, that is an issue that has come up uh, about folks who are known repeat offenders and uh, that warrant not being present and not being visible uh, so those folks on the other side don't see that and subsequently uh, allow for uh, a signature bond uh, but also just the practical implications about the the conduct in general uh, for instance uh, offenses like driving under the influence of alcohol uh, those individuals who don't come back uh, those warrants typically will be placed uh, not only in GCIC but also subject to execution uh, that, of course, creates a lot of different implications for safety uh, on, on the roads, but also with our partners at uh, Fulton County, oftentimes the uh, low-level warrants on this side uh, are also preclusive for an individual being eligible for a signature bond because 
they have an active and open warrant someplace else, uh, which is an indication on uh, their likelihood to uh, return to court and answer the charges. So uh, it, it's something that on this side we are uh, dire of wanting to uh, move beyond so that we can uh, reinstitute this process and, and make sure that uh, everything is appropriate when uh, someone comes in contact with law enforcement. Okay, but it's not been a thing where uh, I know the deputy chief said that they haven't issued any orders or commands to not to do that, but, and of course that hasn't happened from the court side. Uh, no, we have been ever since uh, this spring. Once we uh, we ran an amnesty week for anyone who uh, had an FTA from the COVID period and all of the new 21 cases that were coming in, uh, we began to place those in FTA status, which allows for uh, certain cases to have a 30-day grace period and then began to issue warrants. All of the warrants that have been issued uh, have been uh, rejected and returned. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Chief. I appreciate you responding. Sure. But uh, one other question uh, for our presenter, the judge, the court administrator. You had mentioned the number of FTAs. Uh, is that re is that related at all to uh, enforcement, or just is that just folks who made bond, decided signature bond, and just haven't returned? At this point, the numbers are. Uh, inclusive of, of both of those scenarios. Uh, obviously, for those who are out on bond, uh, if they do not return, obviously, for instance, e even the classification of cases for uh, DUI is a classic example. I mean, you would have undoubtedly, without a doubt, been arrested for the offense. Um, if you don't come back into court, um, there is no recourse without the FTA warrant. I mean, the FTA warrant is that which would compel you to return. So we know that uh, inside of the FTA numbers uh, are some seasonal realities due to uh, COVID, but also uh, we're expecting that the trend will continue to inch higher uh, in absence of any enforcement mechanisms for actual appearance in court. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Judge. And I appreciate you answering the question. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll withdraw. Thank you. Are there questions from any other of my colleagues for the municipal court? Well, thank you all so much. We will now go back to our regular agenda. I appreciate you all, Judge Cordes, and our administrator from the court system. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Lindo, we will now go to our next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. And we will now take up the consent agenda claims for favorable and unfavorable recommendations. Uh, the first being claims for favorable recommendations. Those are items one through seven. Can I get a motion to accept those claims? Move approval, Madam Chair Winslow. Is there a second? Second. All right, there's been a motion and a second. Ms. Lindo, we're ready for the vote. One moment. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Will everyone please vote? I believe we're waiting on Ms. Boone. Yes, my, Madam Chair, yes. Council members, the vote, the vote is closed. That's six yeas, there are nays. Those items are favorable. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We will now take the next items that are unfavorable. We'll start with item number eight first, uh, which is one that Mr. Bond had pulled off our agenda, the council agenda last week, and want to bring it back. Could you sound that? Because Mr. Bond wants to hold that, I believe, Ms. Lindo. Yes. 
Yes, Miss. Yes, Madam Chair. That's twenty one R thirty eight seventy six. This this is an adverse claim for property damages alleged to have been sustained from a water main break on July eighth, twenty eighteen, at twenty three hundred Haven Ridge Drive, Northwest. All right. Claim of uh, Julia Wynn Jones. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Motion to hold. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Winslow. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. We're ready for the vote. Ms. Lindo. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Thank you. Will everyone please vote? Ms. Bone. Yes. Thank you. The vote is closed. That's six years during That item will be held in committee. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We will now take items on favorable claims for items 9 through 93. Uh, is there a motion to uh, support those unfavorable claims? Is there a motion? So moved. Move. One below Thank second. Thank you. Ms. Linda, we're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Will everyone please vote? Council Member Boone? Boone, yes. Yeah. The vote's closed. Six days, zero nays. Those items have been adverse. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We're now down to our regular agenda. Ordinances for second reads, and the first one, which is sound item number one, Ms. Lindo. Yes, Madam Chair, that's 2106 This is ordered by Council, Member, Council Members Andrea O'Boone, Joyce M. Shepard, J.P. Mazakai, Marcy Collier Overstreet, and, and Natalie M. Archibong, as amended by Finance Ex Executive Committee to amend Chapter 2, Article 3, Division 1, Section 2 190B in Chapter 2, Article 4, Section 2 194 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to establish the Mayor's Office of Violence Reduction to authorize the Chief Financial Officer to create the appropriate department organizations and to anticipate and appropriate the necessary funding in connection with the creation of the Mayor's Office of Violence Reduction to authorize the Chief Financial Officer and the Commissioner of the Department of Human Resources to transfer any positions currently assigned to any office or department operating under the executive branch to the mayor's office of violence reduction as shall be necessary to facilitate the immediate commencement of the operation of the mayor's office of violence reduction and for other purposes. And Madam Chair, you do have an amendment in your packet to insert the department code in section three of the legislation. Thank you. Um is there a motion to bring the amendment forward? No move. Is there a second? I'll second. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, Please vote. Ms. Winslow, we're waiting on you. In favor. Thank you. The vote's closed. That's six yeas, zero nays. The amendment is before you. All right. Uh, does anyone want to talk about this particular amendment? Is there any questions? I believe, Ms. Lindo, did you not send out some information to our colleagues on what the legislation was about? Yes, there was a summary um, of the uh, department uh, included in your um, package. All right. 
And for folks in the, in the uh, audience, it's uh, basically this legislation to mayor's office of violence reduction overview. This is a program where we will actually create a program around violence, how we deal with reductions of violence in the community around the city. And I am most definitely in support of this. I think this is something we have to do in reference to not just calling the police all the time, but to roll out things in the community where we can actually interact with communities where there is violence and we can come up with a resolution to that. This program is this recommendation is one that will do that. Uh, so my, um, my motion is to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second one. Oh, go ahead, Michael. No, you go, girl. You go. <laughs> <laughs> Second wind's low. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. That was funny. <laughs> Mr. Bond, how did you vote? Aye. The vote is closed. The vote is closed. That's 68 there are This item is favorable as amended. All right. Thank you. We're now in item number two up under resolution. Ms. Lindo, could you sound that one, please? Yes, Madam Chair. That's 21R3929. This is a resolution by Council Member Carla Smith authorizing the mayor or her designee to execute special procurement agreement STS 1220052 electronic applicant file management system with Guardian Alliance Technologies on behalf of the Atlantic Police Department pursuant to section 2 1191.1 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances for a term of one year with three one year renewal options in an annual amount not to exceed $30,600, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from fund department and organization accounts listed herein. This is my question. I'm sorry, Ms. Smith, you want to speak to it? Yes, thank you. Um, this is an electronic filing system uh, for APD to assist them in hiring. Um, they used to use, well, until we did this, they're um, using a manual process, but this is going to bring it into a uh, electronic means of doing it, and it's going to st help streamline and expedite that, their application process. So my motion is to approve. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Second by Mr. Bond. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Linda. A moment. The vote is opening, Madam Chair. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. I believe we're waiting on Mr. Hillis. Any questions? Is there a motion? 
So moved. Thank you, Mr. Bond. There a second. Winslow second. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. Ms. Winslow, we're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. The vote is closed. That's 60 0 Those items are favorable. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We're now at items 5 and 6, which is settlement. And I believe we can take those as a block also. Ms. Lindo, would you sound those, please? Yes, Madam Chair. That's 21R, 4031. This is a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration authorizing settlement of all claims against defendant in the case of Sarah Johnson versus Danny Padron, a, a person, City of Atlanta, a municipality, civil, fa civil action file number listed herein, pending in the state court of Fulton County in the amount of $16,000 and zero cents, and authorizing the settlement the pound to be paid to and charge two accounts listed herein and authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. Resolution number six, 21R, 4032. It's a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the city of Atlanta in the case of Matthew Ryan Littleton versus city of Atlanta. Civil action file number listed herein in Fulton County State Court in the amount of $9,000 and authorizing the set amount to be paid Take two and from accounts listed herein, and authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute this total settlement settlement amount and for other purposes. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. Any questions? If not, I will entertain a motion. Move approval of both pieces. Thank Back you, Ms. Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Ms. Lindo, we're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Thank you. The vote is closed, six days, zero names. Those items are favorable. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We have two items now. We're down to uh, items up under hell, and there will be two, well, actually one. One item will come off of hell, and that's item number 20. And then we also have a walk-in paper right behind that to say companion to item number 20. Ms. Lindo, would you sound that, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Item number 20, Resolution 21-4031. Justin Hillis, Andrea Boone, Michael Julian Bond, Carla Smith, and Cleta Winslow as amended by the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee to establish the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center Community Stakeholder Advisory Committee for the purpose of continued community engagement and input in the development of the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center property and for other purposes. And Madam uh, Chair, we do have a substitute in your packet that includes yes the membership mm -hmm. and make some other uh, changes to um, the appointment of the committee members? Yes, we do have, if you all have not had a chance to look over that yet. But what we've substituted uh, at this today in terms of the uh, substitute is actually uh, basically specifically defining who will be on the stakeholders committee. So we have uh, from DeKalb County, we have uh, residents from uh, the Boulder Walk community, someone from the Starlight Heights neighborhood, the Cedar Grove neighborhood, East South Walk Housing Development, Gates and Boulder Crest Condominium Complex, uh, DeKalb County Board of Commissioners, DeKalb County Parks and Recreation, and a representative from DeKalb County District 6 representative. Those who represent DeKalb County. And from the city of Atlanta, we have NPUV, the South River Garden Community Association, the Thomas Hill Heights Civic Association, Stonewall Heritage Community Association, the Atlanta Police Department, the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department, uh, the chair of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee, 
the mayor or the city of Atlanta or the mayor's deputy. So that's how we actually substituted it and put any other language in that we needed. And so that is what's before us at this point that we were asked to be voted up. Motion to approve. Thank you. Thank you. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Linda. Oh, Madam Chair, I believe this is to bring the substitute forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion to bring the substitute forward. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. The bus closed. Got six years zero name. The substitute is before you. Motion to uh, approve the substitute. Back up. All right. Is there someone who's asking to speak? Is there someone who pressed now, the button to speak? Where is this? Where are the neighborhoods written down? I want to double check and make sure that the. Uh, uh, I wanted to double check on a couple that are in my district. Well, we have, again, I just called them out to you. I no, know. One of them I don't think I heard. Anyway, uh, we can we can change it later if we need to. What, what, what neighborhood? Go ahead and tell me so we can work on it. Um, it's, you know, it's down in NPUZ. Um, it's called Stonewall Heritage. Did you put it on there? Uh, yes, I believe Stonewall Heritage is on here. Stonewall Heritage, yes. Yay, I heard Thomasville, but I didn't. I don't know why I'm, I missed Stonewall. So, okay, I'm going to text that it's on there, too. Okay, thank you. It's Thomasville Heights, Stonewall Terrace. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, in South River Garden and Ann Phillips and Yes, I have them. Perfect, perfect. All right. Uh, I think there was a motion in a second. Right, Ms. Lindo? I can't remember where we were. We ready yes, for the vote? Yes. yes, yes, we are. All right. One moment. The vote is open. Ms. Lindo, how did you vote? In favor. Thank you. The vote's closed. That's six years, zero names. That item is capable on substitute. Thank you. Now we have a walk-in paper. We don't have a number for it, but it's a walk-in today. And it ties directly to this committee that we just voted up. With the uh, assumption and I hope the approval of council, we will be voting up this legislation. What we also want to do, because to be honest with you, the Cab County and the folks in the city, they are ready to go, including the Atlanta Police Foundation. And they did not want to drag this out. So what we have done is actually introducing a walk-in paper today, and we've actually already appointed individuals who will represent these various entities in the neighborhood. So that is what we're introducing today. And Ms. Lindo, I would like to ask that you read that in, please. Yes, Madam Chair. This is a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration to appoint members to the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center Community Stakeholder Advisory Committee and for other purposes. And what we have in there specifically, it talks about the where this in terms of creating a stakeholders group, pretty much like the last piece of leg uh, legislation we just approved. But what we've done specifically with this one is actually identify who they are. So if you look at it, you see Allison Clark, she represents the Bold Walk community, Nicole Morando, Starlight Heights neighborhood, Pat Clark, Cedar Grove neighborhood, Sean Billisley, Eastside Walk Housing Development, Corey Parker, Gates and Boulder Park Condominium Complex, Commissioner Larry Johnson, the Cap County Board of Commission, uh, Jerry Basin, the Cab County Park and Recreation, Amy Keller, representing District District Six representative, 
and from the city of Atlanta, it would be uh, Ann Phillips Neighborhood, NPUV, Shirley Nichols, the South River Garden Community Association, Othello Lee, uh, Thomas Hill Heights City Police, Jacqueline Rainey, Stonewall, Harris's Community Association, Deputy Chief Darren Sherbaum, the Atlanta Police Department, Fire Deputy Chief James McLemore, the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department, the Chair of the Atlanta Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. So at this point, you probably should put my name in there, Ms. Um, Lindo, as long as I'm chair. It may have to change in the next year or so, but you can just go ahead and put my name as the designee if you would like. Uh, then the mayor of the city of Atlanta of the mayor of Desiree. I'm not sure who that is at this point. I did nothing over step on my part. I'm assuming it's Mr. Johnson, but I don't know. So we'll just go ahead and approve it as is. If we can get that name by Monday, we can just take this off and go ahead and get it approved. So that is the motion. I just want to make people clear about what was going on. Uh, so I'll make a motion to approve. Back. Madam Chair, I'd like to make an amendment to put your name in there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. All right. It's been motioned by Ms. Winslow and approved by Mr. Bond to put your name in. To put my name in. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so all the things we're ready for the vote, <laughs> Ms. Winslow. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Waiting on Mr. Hillis. The vote is closed at 60. Is there any that item has been amended? All right. Now, is there a motion to, uh, to move it forth as amended? Move approval as amended. All right. The same time we're ready for the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. That's 60 and zero names. This item is favorable as amended. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Lindo, do we have anything else before us today? You do have an executive session, Madam Chair, so we will leave a motion ah, to go into it. Yeah. You know what? I totally forgot that and you didn't tell me. Guys, we have an executive session that we have to go into. Thank you. Uh, so I will make a motion to go into executive session. This is for a legal issue with the city of Atlanta, and we need to go into executive session to discuss it. There's a motion. Second. That, that's, and there's a second by Mr. Bond. Law Department, Amber, did I do that right? Um, yes, as you could state the reason for the um, executive session on the record, um, that was. Um, Amber, can you state the reason for the executive session? Can I state the reason for the executive session? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Okay. We, I do believe have, the reason for the executive session is to discuss um, pending um, litigation. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, maybe I didn't say it right. That's what I thought it was. I was that's why I was thinking that I need to say something. Pending litigation. So the yes. reason for the executive session is for pending litigation. I, I got it right now. So we have a motion and a second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Uh, are we waiting? Ms. Winslow, did you it's second In it? favor. In okay, favor. Thank you. thank you. The vote is closed. Six days, zero days. There was now an executive session. I believe um, law will be sending you, or our staff will be sending you the access information. Uh, okay, well, go ahead. let's make sure we go ahead and send it so that we can go ahead and 
and it does. So please, we're waiting on it. So I guess we will hang up from here and go back in and then come back out. So everybody out right. there, everybody out there, please hold on. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back.
One, two, three. We're here for the launch finally of the beginning of the complete street for improvements along the Cab Avenue. This project is very, very important. It falls into the category of promises made being promises kept. There's been a lot of charrettes and community engagement around improvements to this district. It's been fits and starts around implementation and scope. We finally have a scope. We finally have allocation of funding. They've selected the contractor. We are finally getting started. This is an important corridor that connects DeKalb County to Atlanta. It connects to Stone Mountain and some other bikes and trails. So this is a very, very important corridor. This is phase one. We're looking forward to having phase two happen in the near future, but we're excited to finally have a start to a very important project. Even though it's overcast, this is an incredibly exciting day. Um, the Cav Ave has been a dangerous street on the east side of Atlanta for a long, long time. Uh, and I am super excited that we're breaking ground on phase one today, um, making this safer for the neighborhoods that touch it on both sides, for folks who ride MARTA or who cycle down on their way to or from downtown. Um, but I want to underscore that this is just phase one, um, that there is unfinished work that we have here. and. It'll be important to pass a new TSPLOS and a new infrastructure bond next spring um, so we can do the full project um, and give our residents what they deserve. It's all part of the larger, you know, honestly, the Vision Zero um, of making sure that no Atlanta resident is injured or dies um, on our streets. And today's groundbreaking is a step in making sure that that doesn't happen again on DeKalb Ave. And this is an exciting day to be able to come out here for this groundbreaking where we are uh, breaking ground on the uh, DeKalb Avenue uh, safety improvements. This project has been in the making for quite a while and I'm glad that the community gave their input in the beginning for us to even come to this place to get this uh, project started and then throughout the process they have always advocated and been very patient but now today we're ready to get started on this project and how exciting it's going to be to have people uh, that, mot that motorists that are on this road, cyclists, wheelchairs, pedestrians will be much safer on a better road that services everyone. This project specifically is about safety. A number of the projects are about uh, creating uh, beautification, making sure the roads are smooth. All that's important, but uh, specifically this project 
is because we had this reversible lane that has been there for so long that individuals have sometimes had head-on collisions because they didn't know if it was supposed to be going uh, east or west at this time of day. And so it's caused crashes that we can avoid by now having this to be a proper shared lane. And so then we also are going to have protected bicycle lanes that uh, wheelchairs, bicycles, uh, scooters, and others can utilize to stay out of the road. So this is about safety, getting people where they're going each day and where they're going in life in a safe way is going to be critical, whether they're riding MARTA or whether they're just taking a trip. Two, three, toss. We're here because uh, to celebrate the groundbreaking for the first dog park in District 4, and not only in District 4, but in Southwest Atlanta, and it's right here in the Mosley Park community, so we're very excited to be here today. It's important to have a dog park for, really for the, for the health of the dog, uh, as well as the health of the community. There are a lot of people that, they live in inner city, so there may not be enough land, you know, let's say for a large dog, they may not have enough land for a large dog just to run around uh, the backyard or the front yard. And so when you have that dog park, then they can bring the dog to the park and, and just let them have fun with other dogs. I just really want to thank the Friends of Mosley Park for all of their work over the last four or five years with their visioning plan and helping us move forward and uh, Park Pride has just been tremendous in regard to raising monies that, that have been needed and uh, the Parks Department under the guidance of Doug Vaz has just been tremendous with getting the job done and, and Park Design has done, done a great job with taking the visioning plan and putting it in reality on paper and then bringing it out here and putting it, uh, 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 making the projects work right here on the ground in this 33 acre space. But it is an honor to serve you and to be able today to honor a great citizen. Someone who's been here through the hard times, the good times, and has stayed so much an important part of what makes Kirkwood wonderful. And so this is the highest honor that the city of Atlanta can confer upon any citizen. It is a proclamation. And it is in honor of your life and your legacy. We're here today to commemorate the 100th birthday of a Kirkwood neighbor, Miss Thelma Favors. For his work as an accomplished performer, jazz film documentarian, composer, conductor, and historian, and his commitment to jazz education. Dr. James Hardy Patterson is an institution. He loves Atlanta and he's given so much to Atlanta and helped us here in Atlanta to uplift and make jazz a part of our lives here in the city of Atlanta. And it was an honor and a privilege to give the proclamation to him today. It was signed by myself and all 15 members of council. And we certainly want to recognize people. We want to give them their flowers while they do. And his are overdue. We should have been uh, proclaiming him a long time ago. But now at this festival, at this time, I think is even more appropriate that he can be with other musicians and, and be around the spirit and the, and the movement of jazz around him and in the air. And I think he really appreciated it. We certainly miss coming together. We certainly miss our jazz festival, something that we look forward to every year, uh, sort of a rite of passage for summer. But you know, the fall, uh, this going into the fall, it's not bad, it's not as hot, uh, but people are coming out and able to social distance and enjoy good jazz music and fellowship with family and friends uh, and hear the great sounds of jazz. Jazz history means a lot to Atlanta. There are many things that the city builds on and you think about 
what brings people to Atlanta and jazz, and particularly uh, all of the jazz festivals that we have, they bring visitors in from other places. And when people come, some of them want to stay because of the music. I know music brought me to Atlanta. Uh, and then some people, you know, they come and they want to continue to visit. And of course, that helps our revenue, it helps our city, and it certainly helps Atlanta's brand. We're talking about a green space. You know, we've talked about putting a green space over there. We're here today actually celebrating a sneak -a peek of the opening of the South Side Trail. Several years ago, we built out the West Side Trail, and we got funding in the last two years to actually finish connect the West Side Trail to the South Side Trail. We're in the neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Capelview, Capelview Manor, or Dare Park. And because the community had been working so hard with this for the last two years and giving real community input in terms of the dream and the vision of the Southside Trail, I thought Good afternoon. Okay, let's see who we have back. Do we have, uh, maybe we need to do a roll call. Oh, yes, Madam Chair. Council Member Dustin Hillis? Present. Council Member Andrea Boone? Council Member Smith? I'm here. Councilmember Winslow? Present. Councilmember Bond? Here. <coughs> Councilmember Boone? Madam Chair, we have all present except Councilmember Boone, and you do have a quorum of members present. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we are actually uh, now officially making a motion to come out of litigation, of meeting with executive sessions for litigation issues. Is there a motion to come out? So move. Second. All right. Thank you. The motion is second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. One moment. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. I think we're waiting on Ms. Smith. I got, Madam I got him bumped off. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, yes, sir. Oh. I'm sorry? That Councilwoman Boone says she's on hold. She can't get okay, to me. Can, can somebody please unmute Ms. Boone? She says she's on hold. She's texting us saying she's on hold. Staff is checking, Madam Chair.
Madam Chair, I believe Council Member Boone is on the line. Boone. I'm Ms. Boone. I'm Ms. Boone. We, we were just taking a vote to come out of executive session, so we're waiting on you. So I'm assuming I did you're the vote. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank just you. Madam Chair, the vote is closed at six years zero nays to exit executive session and reconvene. Okay. Ms. Lindo, you all, I just got a call. I, I texted the mayor's office a moment ago to ask them if they had a designee for that stakeholder group and who was it. And they just texted back and told me it would be Mr. Justin Johnson. So I'd like to maybe pull that last piece of legislation up to walk in one and just add his name so we can go ahead and get that out the way. If we can have a motion to reconsider, Madam Chair. A, mo a motion to reconsider. Second. All right, there's a motion to reconsider in a second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is open. One moment. The vote is open, Madam Chair. All right. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? Ms. Winslow? Mr. Hillis. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Winslow. Let's just go ahead and close the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is closed. That's five years, zero names. This item is back on the floor. So I want to make an amendment at this point to that and add uh, for the mayor's designee for the stakeholder committee of the name of Mr. Justin Johnson from the mayor's office. Second. All right, just in a motion and a second. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. All right. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. All right. The vote is closed. That's six days, zero days. That item's been amended. Okay, so I'm, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, as amended. Exactly. I'm ready for the vote, Ms. One moment. The vote is open, Madam Chair. All right. We're ready for the vote, guys. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. Mr. Hillis, we're waiting on you. All right, Ms. Lindo. The, the vote is closed. That's six years, zero names. That item is approved as amended. Favorable as amended. Thank you. All right, we're now at the actual, at the end of our agenda. Uh, are there any, is there anything else for the good of the body? Any comments, any announcements? Here we go. Yes. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Good meeting. Thank you all so much. Good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good Good meeting. Thank you. Okay.